let's I gotta make sure we're gonna coordinate this here so um, I got mine up no they can't see it they can see theirs so what slide are you on there we're on your uh, opening side the medicinal cannabis all right next slide next slide is up learning objectives that's up all right okay so all right thanks everybody for uh sorry about the technical problems there we'll move so my name's uh, dr john ebert i'm a primary care uh, general internist i'm also board certified in addiction medicine i've been i've been working in primary care for 22 years and uh, i've come on to this sort of the medical cannabis scene by just uh out of need really for my uh, understanding this for my patients as they've been using uh, medical cannabis um, and i've also been certifying patients for medical cannabis so i want you to have a brief understanding of cannabis uh, history in the United States. I want you to know what medicinal cannabis is. I want you to understand what the benefits are from a therapeutic perspective and understand a little bit about the legal architecture. And then we'll just talk about the Minnesota Medical Cannabis Program, you know, briefly. But then I have some uh, specific um, information about Iowa that I put into this PowerPoint. So next slide. Uh, I do not have any financial disclosures. So next slide. Um, is the next slide. So a, a brief history of cannabis in the United States um, is that really hemp production, hemp is a type of um, fiber rich cannabis plant and hemp was really grown and uh, was encouraged in the U.S. colonies um, because it had the, the, it had a high fiber content it could be used for ropes, fabrics, fiberboard and uh, paper and then cannabis has been listed in the U.S. pharmacopoeia from 1850 in 1942, it was indicated uh, for labor pain, nausea, and rheumatism. Um, I'm going to teach you about the different. Next slide. I'm going to teach you a different, uh, a little bit about the um, the different types of cannabis plants that we talk about. Um, and really, we, uh, but but at least if you look at one of the components of cannabis, which is THC, which everybody seems to have focused on. Uh, early on when we were sort of developing our understanding of medical cannabis. THC is really the one that produces the high. And it seemed to be for a long time that it, more was better. And so they really pushed the THC content in, in some of the U.S. products. Um, and you can see that kind of on the, if you look at THC potency by year, you see how that's increased. Now, you'll, oh, next slide. Thank you. Um, you'll know, um, so on here I've got two, a picture of cannabis sativa and cannabis indica. Now these are the traditional types. They used to talk about how cannabis sativa um, would really uh, produce more of a mind high and indica would be producing more of a body high. And uh, really they don't talk about that much anymore with current horticultural techniques. They really talk about chemotypes and I'll talk about uh, what that means in a little bit in a minute. But really, um, it's because they do so much crossbreeding of the cannabis strains. Next slide. If you looked at cannabis plant, um, if you took a cannabis sativa plant or an indica plant, and you actually pulled it apart and you know biochemically analyzed it, you'd see that there are 104 different phytocannabinoids. Phyto means plant, cannabinoids mean cannabis-like or can, uh, cannabinoid-like, which has a very specific um, uh, meaning because it actually acts on the CB1 receptors in the brain. But despite about 104 different phytocannabinoids, we really, really only know a little bit about three of them, and those are THC, which is tetrahydrocannabinol, CBD, which is cannabidiol, and CB, which is cannabinol. And you can see the different, I'm not going to read them off to you, you can see the different properties that a lot of these belie are believed to have, but I highlight offset psychoactivity of THC under CBD because this is particularly crucial when we think about medical cannabis, as you'll see in a minute, um, that it, you can't just have a product with just THC because it actually is potentially have more adverse consequences than a blended product, and it's something that we need to be aware of as we move forward in this space. Next slide. So um, I have a molecule uh, rotating on the right. Um, it used to be in high school, clever kids would say to me, if God didn't want me to smoke pot, why did he give me a cannabis receptor? And that was true up until 1992. 
1992, um, in Jerusalem, they discovered an endogenous cannabinoid. So your brain makes a molecule that's just like cannabis, and it's called anandamide. And anandamide um, actually acts on the CB1 and CB2 receptors. The CB1 are in the central nervous system, and the CB2 are in the peripheral nervous system. Next slide. And you can see that the reason why cannabis or TH, with THC in there, predominantly THC, because CB, the, the CBD works a little differently. It has weak activity um, on CB1 receptors, but THC is very specific for, for the CB1 um, receptors in the brain. And you can see that the biochemical similarity between the endogenous cannabinoid that we make, which is anandamide on the right, and THC on the left, it fits like a lock and key in those receptors. And we co-evolved with the cannabis plant so that when we started consuming it or smoking it or eating it, it just happened to be acting on the same receptors. Mother Nature is a parsimonious old gal. I know that seems like a sexist thing to say, but it was actually said by someone who is a uh, addictionologist in the 1960s. And the interesting thing is that your brain doesn't make any receptors for which there are no endogenous molecule or neurotransmitters to act on them, and your brain does not make any endogenous neurotransmitters for which there are no receptors. So whenever humans are interacting with drugs in their ex external environment and getting high from them, it's because those drugs in the external environment are working on receptors you have in your brain. And most of the time, it's way more higher concentration than your body's used to, and that's why everybody gets hooks, hooked on these medications or these drugs and struggles with addiction. So next slide. Um, CB1 is a, cannab uh, is a CB1 receptor, a cannabis, re a cannabis receptor is very specific. Um, it actually is in the presynaptic terminal. So on the, you have a presynaptic and postsynaptic terminal when you're transmitting um, a, neuro, uh, a neural signal. And CB1 receptors on the presynaptic terminal, uh, on a terminal, which has very important implications for what we think anandamide, which is your endogenous neurotransmitter, does to the brain. We think anandamide is very important for suppression of memories, specifically probably painful memories. And that's why people who, have, who smoke a lot of THC forget things probably, um, because it's actually suppressing your ability to lay down new memory tracks. Uh, next slide. And as I said, Mother Nature is a parsimonious old gal. I promise that's the last time I'll say that. But what's also interesting about the, the, the brain chemistry is that there are not as many receptors as there are functional um, sort of manifestations of things that result, in, it, that result as a result of neurotransmitter activity. That is to say, where let's take dopamine, for example. The impact of dopamine in the deep part of the reptilian brain known as the nucleus accumbens is very strongly associated with drug reinforcement and addiction. Dopamine in the prefrontal cortex or the neomammalian brain is very, is very um, uh, influences our ability to focus. So, so dopamine receptors in different parts of the brain have different neurophysiologic effects. Same thing too with CB, CB receptors. Where that CB receptor is has everything to do with how the THC is going to, or anandamide in, 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 in other cases, is going to impact um, what the neurophysiologic uh, effects are. As you can see here, as a correlated brain structure uh, with, with uh, sort of the neurophysiologic uh, effects. And these are some of the pharmacodynamic effects of cannabis. They somewhat overlay um, a lot of the effects of uh, anandamide. Um, but what's happening here is the reason why um, you are getting these effects such as paranoia, anxiety, vomiting, somnolence. This is because the concentrations that people are taking when they self-administer a drug is exponentially higher than what the brain would naturally secrete um, with respect to anandamide. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about cannabis delivery. Um, so uh, as we scroll through, you can keep scrolling through, uh, there's a lot of different ways to uh, deliver cannabis. One is smoking, which is traditional combustion or pyrolysis. Uh, the next is you can eat it edible. Just advance the slide and you'll see these other forms. This is a sublingual spray. You can spray it underneath your tongue. 
This is a product that's available in the UK. You can absorb cannabis transdermally. You can put it in the rectum in the form of suppository. Uh, you can give it a topical, you can ingest it as a smoothie, or you could dab it or inhale it, <clears throat> which is essentially a super concentrated form of THC or CBD that's cooked on what they call a nail over there on the right with a butane torch. Um, and then vaping. So there's a lot of overlap. I think I was with you a couple months back maybe talking about electronic cigarettes, and there's a lot of blend, bleed over from electronic cigarettes into cannabis. The devices that people use to aerosolize uh, nicotine are the same devices that they use to aerosolize cannabis. And uh, so these are kind of the vaping devices that they use. You all have had cannabis available to you or THC available to you um, um, synthetically for a long time. The problem is, and the reason why you don't prescribe them is because they don't work that well and they're incredibly expensive. You've been able to prescribe Marinol, um, or at least you might have different experiences for me. me. For me, they haven't worked that well in my 22 years of experience. Um, uh, but uh, the Marinol is very expensive. If, if you want to give 60 pills for your patient, your insurance won't cover it and they'll get a bill for $3,000. If you want to use Nabilone, you could give them that as well. Um, and for 120 pills, it's about $10,000. So that's why we don't use those products very much. Next slide. Let's talk a little bit about the therapeutic benefit of cannabis. So if you spend some time on the internet Googling things at, in the wee hours of the morning, as I tend to sometimes do with my insomnia, you'll find that when you go to places like Leafly, which is sort of a consumer site for cannabis, you'll see that there are a lot of things that cannabis will solve for you. Bipolar disorder and OCD and PTSD and depression, and you can see that the combination that will solve that problem for you is CBD or cannabigerol or tetrahydrocannabinol. Of course, there's no data to support any of this, right? So, next slide. The data that I would really rely heavily on so that you can make informed decisions for your patients and as an active practitioner are really informed by this great report. Next slide, sorry. The slide that you should be looking at is the health effects of cannabis and cannabinoids, uh, which came out from the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. This made my job and in talk incredibly easy, and I'll go through with you um, briefly what, what the summary from that document was. Next slide. A lot, of the, um, a lot of the assumptions about what was effective with respect to cannabis for medical indications comes out of a systematic review that was published in J J uh, JAMA in 2015. And it was a randomized controlled trial that essentially took all the randomized trials looking at different indications and different preparations uh, for um, medical um, symptoms, and you can see they're listed here. I won't read them off to you, but most of them were relating to nausea and vomiting, related to chemotherapy and chronic pain. And you can see the other ones there. Next slide. The problem, as you know, with a systematic review is you're basically putting a lot of stuff together and trying to make some assumptions about what worked. So when I tell you about what worked based upon a lot of this data, I will tell you that the problem with trying to understand what exactly worked is complicated by the fact that these trials included lots of different preparations, and they're listed here, and I won't read them for you. But the important thing to remember is this makes it very, very difficult as a practitioner to tell your patient what specific product works for, for what specific condition. And that's the bad news in this space is that's the best we can do. But at least as a general class, I will walk through you for uh, I'll, I'll walk through for you what we think seems to work in the cannabis space. Next slide. So these things are very clearly beneficial, uh, or that cannabis is clearly beneficial for three things, and that's reducing nausea and vomiting, reducing pain, and reducing spasticity. So I think that's clear, and I think there's a little debate about that. Next slide. And, and the National Academies of Science did a nice job actually going through the document. It's a very long document. You can download it for free off the internet. Um, they did a very nice job really ranking that medical evidence and saying that it's conclusive or inconclusive or there's substantial or um, inadequate evidence. And for the three indications I've, I've, I've indicated for you there, the uh, National Academies of Science has indicated there's conclusive and substantial evidence for those three really medical symptoms. 
And let me make the other caveat that really, when you think about a disease, cannabis has never really been proven to treat any disease. I want you to have the frame as a provider that really all we're doing right now in the current state of the science is we're treating symptoms related to a medical disease. We are not treating diseases, and I want to make that very clear. These are, this is, cannabis should be viewed right now as a symptom control strategy until there's data coming out otherwise. That's all we're at, that's all we got right now. Next slide. And everybody says, oh, glaucoma, glaucoma. There's no evidence that it works for glaucoma. So this is kind of how reality and medical evidence are completely divorced from policy. So there are 31 states that have it approved for medical cannabis uh, in the United States. The slide that I have later is 28 because like in the last two weeks, they had three more approved it and I didn't have time to update my slides. So it's a moving target. And what's happening at the state level is you have people that are very uninformed medically and don't have a lot of evidence base actually setting state policy on what should be it, it should be approved for. So a lot of the indications and medical conditions that people can be approved for medical cannabis have zero or negative evidence supporting their efficacy. So I want you to be aware of that as well. Next slide. So the summary basically is that it works uh, for nausea and vomiting. It works for uh, reducing pain and it probably improves uh, muscle spasticity as well. Uh, so those are the big three. But I think even we need to spend a little time talking about the uh, adverse health effects. Um, and what time do we end? Um, one ten. Okay, great. So I'm I'm gonna be I'm gonna stay on target. I'm gonna stay on time. All right, good. Okay, so cannabis adverse health effects. Let's spend a little bit of time talking about this because when we're informing our patients and having discussions with our patients in a clinical setting, this is really what I think we need to be informed about. I've, cert I've certified 66 patients in the state of Minnesota for medical cannabis, and I'm following these people with a prospective cohort sending out surveys, none of which them fill it out very much, but I've got some data, um, and I can s share that with you. Um, but I think it's, it's just part of um, my general notion that we just need to collect a lot more data in this space. So next slide. I think the thing that everybody worries about um, is is psychosis. So, a lot of the a lot of the literature I think it's important to remember about psychosis comes from people smoking cannabis. They're they're buying off the street, so they are buying whole plant organic material, putting it in a cigarette, and God knows what's in it, and they're smoking that. And then a lot of the data that are coming from these large longitudinal prospective population-based studies is informed by people that are smoking it recreationally. Because remember, the United States, California, was actually the first state in the world to approve cannabis for medical use. It is a, it is a misunderstanding that Amsterdam or Holland or the Netherlands actually approved this because it's actually not legal there at all. What they have is they have the state saying, actually supporting the black market by having permissive allowance of use of hashish um, for people that want to travel there and do that, but it is not legal under 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 law. So the United States was actually the first, um, either auspiciously or inauspiciously, and we will suffer the public health consequences from that decision. As the jury's still out on what we're going to see here, but but I think this, but I but it's important to remember that in that context, that most of the consumption that we're getting data on is illegal consumption. And I want to give you that caveat as people that are thoughtful and who are providers to know that the data that you're giving your patients about risk is based upon something they're probably not going to be doing because as I'll talk to you in a minute, the medical cannabis programs are very different um, in, in, in the different states. In, some, in, 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 in Minnesota, you can't actually smoke the whole plant. So I want to give that big caveat about the adverse effects here is that the adverse effects you might be quoting may not actually, not actually be applying to the products they're using. So psychosis is the one to think about. There's, good, there's data that suggests that cannabis can increase the likelihood of psychosis. Next slide. The other thing is that it probably could increase depression. I have seen patients in my practice who are on medical cannabis and it seems to exacerbate some underlying depression. So it's important to monitor these patients 
It's important not to um, let them just go out and be using medical cannabis. We need to follow these patients clinically, as is good clinical practice for most patients who are suffering from chronic medical illnesses. Next slide. Cannabis and memory problems. It seems to impair memory. There's good data from longitudinal cohorts. And this is what I said last time, and I'll say it again, is that any potentially addictive drug or any chemical that potentially has a neurophysiologic impact on the brain before the age of 25 potentially changes neurophysiology for the rest of that person's life. So if you can keep a drug or a kid off of any drug until the age of 25, the likelihood they'll ever be addicted to it after the age of 25 is almost 0%. 99.9% of all drug addiction is set up before the age of 25, and that's because the human brain continues to develop until the age of 25. So there's good data that in young people smoking cannabis that it significantly impairs them cognitively. And that's the difference between graduating from college and not for some of these cohort studies. Um, and so heavy cannabis smokers do have significant cognitive impairment. But once again, this is, this is smoking marijuana and at levels that probably are, even our medical cannabis patients might not be exposed to. So take that with a grain of salt. Next slide. There's probably, there's good evidence. There's a lot of tar in cannabis when people smoke it. And so um, it probably worsens lung disease and probably results in emphysema, which you know is an autoimmune disease, which is essentially um, the body attacking the tar particles that come in when people smoke cigarettes and with all the tar that comes in with cannabis. The difference between cannabis smoking and tobacco smoking is in tobacco smoking, most patients will be smoking 20 cigarettes a day and some of, our, some of the patients out there who are self-managing um, medical conditions with cannabis are you know, taking one to two hits a day. So it's a different level of exposure, um, but there may be some evidence that it may worsen at least um, uh, emphysema or obstructive lung disease. Very good evidence that, oh, next slide, sorry. Cannabis and accidents. So very good evidence that if you're high, you're probably gonna crash your car. Um, good evidence that it impairs um, reaction times. Um, there, is a, uh, there is moderate evidence for an association between cannabis and some overdose injuries. Um, that occurs in patients who are concomitantly using other sedating drugs. Next slide. There's good evidence in, in uh, substantial evidence of an association between maternal smoking and low birth offspring and also um, some complications um, in the infant. So let me make it easy for you. So here's kind of the summary that I think you need to be aware of as providers having discussions with your patients, is that perhaps the cannabinoids increase the risk for psychotic symptoms, depression, memory problems, respiratory symptoms, accidents, and low birth weight. And um, let me just hold on. So hold on to that as I go through the kind of the rest of the slides and really how the programs, uh, the medical cannabis programs are kind of set up. So what are the legal considerations for medical cannabis in the United States? And then we'll talk a little bit about Iowa. So what's clear is that the number of patients who are using medical cannabis is you know, exploding in this country. And you can see from 1996 to 2002, there were really 50,000 patients. And now uh, up until 2016, there's really 2 million patients that are receiving this. Um, this is a very good report. Um, that's put out by uh, a group called Americans for Safe Access. And I just highlight this to you in case you have any interest in the cannabis policy um, aspect of this. This group actually rates all the state cannabis programs based upon a number of different domains, including how, how are the laws written to protect people who might get kicked out of their apartments or be arrested or pulled over when they're driving. Um, not all the states are created equally with their cannabis laws, um, as we learn. Oh, this was a slide that is now 31, but let's just look across the uh, United States here. <clears throat> Iowa is not registered there. We'll talk about Iowa here in a little bit. But um, cannabis, um, if you look at cannabis laws by state, at least according to this graph, um, you can see the cannabis laws by state, of, and then you can see the recreational laws um, by state as well. Um, I, will, I will, if we have a couple minutes, I will make a comment about what I believe are some of the concerns 
about conflating medical cannabis laws with recreational cannabis laws and the dangers posed to our patients potentially in the states who are accessing medical cannabis who are now actually being taxed at recreational cannabis prices. Um, so that's a problem. Here's some. Oh yeah, next slide. Thank you. Okay, uh, next slide. I got 10 minutes. I'll get there. Um, so here's what happened uh, in the states. When we started to, um, you can see the medical cannabis laws in terms of the number of states passing them. The states really started to engage when, when, we, de when, when we started developing products that had low levels of THC and high CBD. Kind of all, all, so all the stigma with cannabis is related to the fact that people get high. And you know, um, we can moralistically look at that and say, yes, okay, it's not okay to get high, um, but certainly we, we, we allow the sale of alcohol. So you, you, can, you can have your own kind of personal perspective on that, but that's why states have not engaged. And so when we started developing products that actually had high CBD, which people believed is really kind of the therapeutic molecule in cannabis, then states started to sign on. Next, next slide. And this is the Minnesota program. And I show you this because this is how I think a lot of the state's programs are being set up. And um, our, our state program has colors. And on the left-hand side is black, which is THC dominant. So lots of, you know, 90% THC, 10% CBD on the left. And on the right is CBD dominant. Um, you know, in unviolet, it's actually 100% CBD. And you can see that in the middle are more of these balanced products. And so that's how I like to kind of understand the, the, the types of products that our patients have access to. Um, with respect to Eric Holder, um, uh, who was the Attorney General under uh, President Obama, he did actually sort of strike a deal with the states because remember, cannabis is illegal under federal law. That's why you can't prescribe it, and that's why pharmacies can't dispense it. And so a whole new system had to be set up for patients to get cannabis in the way that states are protecting their physicians is you actually don't prescribe it. You have nothing to do with the prescribing at all. You simply certify them for the medical condition that qualifies them under the state program. So, um, so it's, still, it was still, it's still legal under federal law, and the executive branch has said that we will not go after states as long as states you know, do good business and, and, and um, uh, comply with their state policies. So here's a couple pictures of some of the dispensaries um, with lots of different concentrations of, of THC, uh, different names. Um, so, so a couple things, and I'll talk about Iowa. And I think that um, let me just let me just go to the Iowa experience here. Um, so in 2014, um, as I understand it, and you guys can help me here a little bit, um, I'm sitting in a different place, but there was legalization of CBD oil and products that had less than 3% THC. And it was had a limited scope of engagement for patients who had epilepsy, or and it was also illegal to manufacture and transport state across straight lines. So just imagine, you have epilepsy and you live in Iowa, and they said, you can have cannabis, you just can't make it in the state nor import it. So how in the heck are you supposed to get it? So anyway, that's the way that, they, that Iowa sort of launched into the brave new world of cannabis, um, which, which I think they've sort of worked around now. But in 2017, there was expanded number of diseases that could be treated, and they're listed there. As I understand it, you can get oils, creams, gels, capsules, and suppositories. But it works by, you need to get a permit from the Iowa Department of Public Health. And that as I understand it, as I looked on the website, and please you know, educate me here, that you as clinicians, if you're gonna do this, need to complete part of the application for the patient. And that would probably be the part um, that include the medical indication for um, that patient qualifying under the state program. There's one company, MedFarm Iowa, and those are the five dispensaries um, around the state. Um, so, so we can talk about that in a minute, but let me just go back to, I have, as I mentioned, 66 patients or so. Um, the thing that I'm learning about cannabis, and I've learned a lot, um, the thing that I'm learning about cannabis is that the program is really prohibitively expensive. 
in that the state programs and the dispensaries, we have two companies in the state of Minnesota, and the companies are struggling to survive. Um, and um, the products are expensive to produce, they're expensive for patients to buy, and I have patients that say it's just more cost effective for me to buy marijuana off the corner than it is to go and buy these expensive pills. Um, they, the vapor pens that my patients have gone to don't work that well. They can get better cannabis in Colorado, which is probably true, uh, than they can in Minnesota. And so that's one experience. But then I've had other patients who said, this is great. There are a lot of patients who would never smoke cannabis in a million years, but they're willing to try cannabis as a symptom control strategy because they've tried everything else and nothing else works. So my perspective is that I really think about cannabis as a tool that could be leveraged, um, and I'm still learning, and I, I hope I'm not on the wrong side of history on this one, um, but a tool that could be leveraged in clinical practice for patients to self-manage their own symptoms, right? And most of the time, it's 96% of the time, you know, we're talking about pain. So I have patients who have done actually uh, really uh, quite well. So I wanted to stay on time and I want to have time for questions and, and that's kind of what I have on medical cannabis. You want to see me? Yeah. Okay. Sure. And I can see them there. Okay. There. All right. Yeah, sure. All right. Is anybody, I mean, I, I, I would just, I would love for someone to tell me about their cannabis tail, if there is a cannabis tail in Iowa, and are people doing this? So just let me make a comment about that. So like for the first time since 1947, um, um, you know, the FDA has approved a, uh, a CBD, Epidiolex, uh, for um, Gervais syndrome and Lennel Gastel, I think those are the two, I'm probably mispronouncing those, uh, but those are the two conditions for which a CBD oil has been approved. What that means is, remember that cannabis sits with heroin and cocaine as a Schedule 1, DEA Schedule 1, and a DEA Schedule 1, as you, 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 many of you know, says that there's really no medically, uh, there's no medical condition for which this is indicated, and so that means that the DEA necessarily has to reschedule CBD, and the key there is that it's a product that has zero THC. So CBD was recently recategorized as Category 5. Um, okay, great. So GW Pharmaceutical, which is a company that makes Epidiolex, it's a pure plant-based product, um, will probably hit our shelves from pharmacies in mid-November to late December. And it's going to be actually mail order only, and it's limited only to people who have lennox gastel syndrome and Dravet syndrome. Okay, so it's going to be mail order only, I'm sorry, is that is that right? There, there's a, a CVS, Walgreens, and there's one other pharmacy that are going to be the okay. holders for it, and they'll be mailed or shipped to the person's house. That's so my in understanding. My, in my question, I'd be interested in people's thoughts, is how much of this CBD uh, is going to be, you know, we give trazodone all the time for sleep, and that's off-label. Are people going to be doing, C, are going to be, you know, prescribing CBD off-label? Is that going to happen? So the cost of Epidiolex is probably going to be about $32,000 a year. <laughs> and so it's only approved to treat those severe catastrophic epilepsies. So I will tell you that probably most physicians would never prescribe it because most insurance companies will say, no, you have to prove the person has this as a diagnosis would be my guess. Okay. Yeah, fair enough. 
So, yeah, so that's a really good point. So that will be cheaper to buy off the corner. Um, you know, so I, so I would say, too, that um, as, as you all know, because the medical cannabis is not covered by insurance, um, certainly, um, you know, my patients are, it's, it's basically a cash-only business uh, when they go in there. Um, and they have two-for-one deals, and they have punch cards, and I tell them this is going to be very different than dealing with the St. Mary's Hospital Pharmacy. It's going to be a very different experience. It's going, to very, it's going to feel very much like a consumer experience when they go into these dispensaries. So, so Epidiolex is 100 milligrams per ml. So that's the okay. concentration. And if you wanted to say, if I'm going to buy this from a dispensary, you would say, what's the concentration? And the concentration of cannabidiol in those products is probably a lot less than that. Yeah, yeah. I will tell you one uh, interesting anecdote uh, just along that line. So, so what I've learned from my patients as I've talked to them, and I've you know given a lot of cannabis or recommended you know or actually certified patients for medical cannabis is the way to say that. Uh, for pain, obviously that's the number one indication that I've been doing it for, um, because I'm trying to avoid opioids and you know do that whole dance, right? So, what I've learned from them is that the CBD seems to work really well, um, um, you know, for you know for sleep. Um, it works sort of okay for pain, but it seems like on the really severe pain, patients seem to say to me, and it's not just one, it's several that I need a little THC when my pain is really severe. And I kind of have sort of made this paradigm in my mind that maybe CBD is okay for pain, um, because the reason why CBD is indicated for seizures is it can decrease nerve transmission, which is sort of the sine qua non of a seizure. Um, and that maybe it's with neuropathic pain, it's effective for reducing pain for, with CBD. And that CBD might help with pain, and then THC might help with suffering. And so kind of, you know, and, and we're sort of trying to separate those out, you know, to in our mind, you know, they, they're very different experiences, but my patients have said that to me, which is an interesting observation. Twofold questions. Yeah. Um, so one, if an um, oncology patient with bad nausea vomiting is getting dronabinol from Canada, is that legal? And how, where would you send them to have? So what I'm hearing is that the patient is getting uh, dronabinol from Canada. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. Um, what are the legalities and, of that? And it, so that would be someone, and, and I imagine, you know, they're paying, I, the insurance is probably not covering that. Cash. Um, um, would that be someone that people would think about certifying for medical cannabis under the Iowa state law? So that's the direction you should route them to then, is to certify them and... So yeah, so, so I would think that, you know, in 2017, as I'm, you know, uh, Iowa approved it for nausea or, you know, severe wasting, um, that would be a direction that would, that would be, make sense to go. I do know that the company, and I, I have no disclosures here, so I I'm not, don't make any money from these companies, but part of me has been if I want these programs to be in the United States and I want access, then um, you know, it's not that I have to make the company successful, but you know, I need to think about ways of sort of as a medical community um, supporting treatments that I might think might be effective. Um, and I know that MedFarm Iowa has had some financial difficulties because of program restrictions. and. And you know, to think about models for getting patients access and uh, to these things, um, and, I, and like I said, I'm trying not to be a drug pusher. There's a really fine line here. Um, what I'm advocating is I think we need more tools to help patients manage their pain, and I think leveraging the state dispensaries who do have to answer to the state for good manufacturing practices and have to have to be vertically integrated, which makes it really hard to be profitable. They have to control not only the production, but the supply, and be vertically integrated. So, so these things make it really challenging to compete 
Um, and so it's something to think about. And then my next question is on on your screen with all the dots, the colored of dots going from THC to CBD. Um, down at the bottom, it said CBD has no risk of any mental side effects. So is that really true? And what about the people that are getting all these CBD oils? They ask, they tell me about this. And I don't even know what to tell them. Um, so they what they can get for a CBD oil on on the internet right now. Is that really without any mental side effects? That that screen down at the bottom it says CBD dominant. It says, without fear of mental limitations, but I would think with the, with what you were telling us that they, that could still have side effects. Yeah, so kind of cut out there a little bit. So what I'm hearing, uh, asking, yeah, because right, I can see it from my window here where you can go buy CBD oil at our co-op here. Um, and, and once again, I, it, it's, it's, it's about concentration. So the concentration that you can get right, right outside the window here is, is lower than the concentrations that you can get at the state dispensary. Um, and, and, um, and so uh, I would think about, um, the other thing is you're buying it on the internet, which is you know illegal. Uh, it's still legal. So I mean, I, 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 there's a lot of controversy around whether CBD oil is legal. Now everybody's got coverage from a Pedialex, but unless you're having seizures, you know, you're not getting the drug by indication anyway. Um, so, um, so the uh, issue is you can't really, you know, who, you know, are there heavy metals in these CBDs? What are the extraction processes? The nice thing about the state cannabis programs is they do have the answer to the state, um, and there is state oversight of these programs. Um, getting anything on the internet is anybody's guess of what's in it. Um, so there is a safety issue that I express to my patients. Um, it's a cost issue. The CBD right across the street is very expensive. Um, CBD really has minimal side effects. My biggest concern about CBD doesn't really work, um, honestly. I mean, it, that's my concern is I don't know we've got enough of the, con we don't know, we don't understand the concentrations. Um, I get a lot of report facts on, boy, that CBD oil that you recommended to me so I'd stay off the THC does nothing for me. So I don't know if we got the right concentration because I don't, once I certify, it's kind of out of my hands and they were just working with the pharmacist. And honest to God, this is what I heard. This is not just a, they said, yeah, uh, Dr. Eber, thanks for meeting with the pharmacist. These guys smoke pot all the time. They know everything about this stuff. And I'm like, that's not an endorsement. Um, but anyway, so I, I don't, you don't always know what kind of culture you're sending your patients into, but, but I tend to kind of, you know, rely on my state program to give me known concentrations, whether or not those are the right concentrations, I have no idea, and I do rely on the pharmacist there to, to try to figure out dosing with my patients. And then one other question as far as working and driving on these, these products. So it's not unlike alcohol, which has has a it wears off eventually. For people that are using these, should we advise people that are still holding functioning jobs to not be util using these products? So great question. So the data that exists right now is is really around THC. So THC does impair reaction times. Um, CBD really has no psychoactive effects, but it says that it can be an antidepressant and an anxiolytic. So to me, that's a psychoactive effect. But what I think they're trying to say is it doesn't have any impairing psychoactive effects. So that's all THC related. A couple things that are interesting about that. Number one, if you're pulled over, they blow you, they, you do the machine for alcohol. Uh, they don't have a machine for THC. Uh, a lot of the states have not worked out minimum concentrations of uh, THC. If you ever had to go down to the station and have a urine test, but they're not doing that. Um, I do, there is a driving precaution um, about THC, um, and, but w if you actually had to have a drug, this, the bigger question is always, am I, if I get randomly screened at work, what's going to show up in my urine, right? And I tell them, well, if you're taking a product with THC, THC is going to show up, but here's the good news. If you're on a CBD only product, CBD is not going to show up in your urine because most, like no drug screen checks for CBD, it always looks for THC. So. You can take very, very high concentrations of CBD and never have a positive urine drug screen for cannabis. Um, so, so that's the other issue. But yes, driving impairment is a big thing. The other thing I'll mention to you is that you seem to have alluded to the fact that THC is a fat-soluble molecule. That is, 
the more you smoke it, the more it lives in your body and the longer it takes to get out of your body. So if you're a chronic user, it may take you a month to test negative because after you stop using, it continues to bleed out of the adip adipose cells, right? Um, so, but an acute user can be negative in one week because they didn't have enough time to bleed all that THC into their fat cells. So, so, so chronicity is an issue. And most of these patients who I've, I've actually provided, you know, uh, medical cannabis for have chronic issues sort of by definition. So lots of important considerations, lots of legal considerations, and I don't think we've got it figured out. This is uh, almost embarrassingly basic, but uh, what's the duration of action of this stuff before it wears off? Is it dose-related or preparation-related or what? Yeah, um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's dose-related, and it has everything to do with the way in which it's um, consumed. So the big problem with, so, so the nice thing about, well, I'll just say, so the nice thing about vaporization or aerosolization is you get a minute-to-minute -minute titration of how much medication or THC CBD you're getting. When you're vaporizing that and aerosolizing that, you get a minute-to-minute -minute ability to say, my pain's under control, everything's good. When you take a pill, you wait for 40 minutes, and if it was too much, you're stuck with it for four hours. If it was too little, you got to take more. So that's the that's the difference between you've heard the stories, right? There's sort of this funny thing that I mean that, that happens when you eat cannabis. They, um, there's an, uh, there's there was something on the internet that was uh, this is what it's like to consume cannabis. Eight cannabis felt no effect. Eight cannabis felt no effect. Eight cannabis felt no effect. Eight cannabis needed emergency room because what happens is when you eat it. Um, it takes a, it's a delayed onset of action, and so if you're trying to dose yourself, you don't know you dose too much until you overdose it. And then the other thing is THC gets converted by the liver to THC uh, hydroxy THC, and that has a longer half life, and it takes longer to have an effect. So, so, so those are really good questions. And then sublingual dropper acts intermediate between aerosolization and inhalation and oral ingestion. So. So in there between is kind of the duration of effect depends upon dose and it depends upon route of administration. Okay, thanks everybody.